so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Elke Duns, and I'm the Global Director of Programs at the Travel Foundation. And uh, if you can, please introduce yourself in the chat box here, so we, we know who's following this webinar today. I'm sorry, we are all, we are already a few minutes late, so let me just start right away and welcome you to the fourth, uh, fourth webinar in this series of four webinars that have been organized as part of the Transforming Tourism Value Change project in collaboration with the One Planet Sustainable Tourism Program and the World Tourism Organization. Now, uh, let me share uh, our agenda for today with you. Um, we have invited three speakers today, and uh, we have also a lot of time for um, a panel debate because we would like to have uh, an open discussion. And we also would very much appreciate your questions or your input into this uh, topic on sustainable food. I think everybody has good ideas about this, so please join, uh, join us, ask your questions. You can put them already now in the Q&A box. And uh, Alessandro will, uh, will, will try to answer them together with all the other speakers here uh, present today. Um, and today we will talk about sustainable food. And I think it's actually uh, only answerable if we look at the bigger picture. So we talk today not only about a food problem, but we talk about all the gaps in our sustainable food future. And so it's about the food gap, but it's at the same time also very much about the climate gap and the land gap. And I think from the food side, we actually have some quite good news because there will be enough uh, food to feed the 10 billion people by 2050 if, and this is the big thing of today's uh, webinar, I guess, if we can make the necessary changes. And changes are in dietary changes, are reducing food loss and food waste. Now, if we look at the climate change, I think we have a lot of responsibility uh, in our food system because currently our food system is uh, accountable for 27% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And of these 27%, up to 10% is produced only about uh, only with the emissions that are coming from food waste alone. So looking at food waste uh, is looking at how we actually are producing poorly on agriculture, but at the same time, how are we transporting, how are we storing our food? And at the same time, and that's the topic for today, how are we wasting our food in the hospitality sector, in hotels and restaurants? Another topic which is really interesting is, and we all know that if we eat less meat, that we can help to reduce uh, the emissions in climate, but how can we make it possible to serve no longer meat to our guests in our restaurants or in our hotels when we know that they really much like to eat some, some meat nowadays? So how do we do this? And last but not least, it's also about the land gap. And there we know that we will not have more land in the future to grow more food. So how do we do it with the same amount of land? And I'm just giving you a very fast overview of these problems because there are many solutions already. And today in this webinar, we will not focus so much on specific single solutions, although there are many. There are a lot of uh, calculators on food waste already used in restaurants nowadays. There are specific planning and procurement uh, tools that can help you to reduce waste. And all these things you can find on the website of the Travel Foundation. We also organized formally a workshop there. So please have a look. But let me, last but not least, also give you some examples, because uh, as probably you, you have had some experience, we at the Travel Foundation, we also have some experience. And on the left side here on this slide, you will see an example that has been uh, in existence for 10 years now in Cyprus, uh, where we offer local breakfast. You, you can find it in five-star restaurants, you can find it in a local restaurant, but here's like one specific solution and it has been appreciated very much and it's still alive. So yes, it can be very, something really, really small and valuable. And on the right-hand side, and maybe there are some people from St. Lucia here in our webinar today, 
you will see an example of um, what happened on the island when we try to stimulate restaurant holders to put the lionfish on the menu. And what we have seen is that guests also start to eat um, more lionfish. And there's already a link in the chat there, thanks Terry, that will give you all the explanation about this project. But my last slide uh, on, on my example is maybe the most important one, because this is really uh, about um, transforming the value chains. So what have we done? Uh, we have done a project in St. Lucia and in Mauritius, uh, a project that was led by the United Nations Environment Project and funded by the German government's International Climate Change Initiative. We have been just implemented it, implementing it, but it was uh, a project that started with a research phase. And what we have measured was that the food production alone in St. Lucia accounted for 43% of the greenhouse emissions associated with hotels and restaurants. So yes, that's a huge amount of responsibility as a hospitality sector that we had. And the organic food waste represented 45% of the waste in St. Lucia. So we needed to do something. And therefore we developed a national action plan. And the aim of this action plan was to reduce the amount of food waste by the accommodation sector with 50%. So it was a very high ambitious and there was not one single solution. So on the right hand side, you will see uh, a lot of things, different things that we did along the value chain. And I think this is really very important when we look at solutions for uh, the, our food system that we think on the whole, that we, that we see the connection between agri agriculture uh, between composting systems in our hotels and, and really making partnerships along with local farmers along the whole value chain. So I think it's really interesting if you want to have a look at this project. But for now, uh, I, I, want to, I want to just stress that we will look at the whole, uh, at the whole system. As you will see, uh, it's a definition by the Food and Agricultural Organization. Uh, uh, they, they look at the food system through the big lens and they start from nature, but they also take into account the people right in the center. So that's why today we have invited three different experts around the table. So you will see, uh, um, we, will, we, will, we will listen to Caroline and she's a restaurant owner. So she can really talk about the practice. And it's very interesting because it's a plant-based restaurant. So we can learn a lot from her. Uh, we also have, Dr. Alessandro Galli, who's a, he, he's, who's a scientist and who has been studying food, food systems and nature-based solutions. So he looks from a different angle. And we will start right away with Anna, who is actually a marketer, but she tells a story that actually connects all those things that we have been mentioning, all the links in the food system. And she actually makes it a very compelling and attractive story I think she will make you want to start with it right away. So without further ado, I'm happy to pass on the word to Anna. She will share her slides herself. And please, once again, if you have any question or suggestion or something to add to this discussion, please put it in the Q&A box. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I will now uh, share my screen. I hope you, uh, you can see my screen now. Uh, but I just uh, have to, oh, okay. So uh, I hope my screen is now, is, now, is now there and you see me and you hear me well. And um, so hello again to everyone. And um, today I would like to present you a concept that we developed together with Anna Pollock. Uh, she's a famous regenerative travel guru and mentor, and I'm so happy that she's today with us and sending uh, her positive uh, energy along um, uh, to, to, to all of us. Uh, and the concept is, uh, we named it Host for Life, and this demonstrates how hospitality can positively impact food systems. But before I will talk about it, uh, let me start with some introduction and a global overview that uh, will make you understand the essence of this concept. Mm -hmm. 
we are facing climate change. This was already mentioned by Elke. And we all know that greenhouse gases emissions are rising at the alarming level. And we have extreme weather conditions uh, that uh, in places that uh, haven't occurred before. We also know that to prevent average global temperatures rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is scientifically stated as a tipping point for, uh, for Earth, we must stop generating carbon dioxide emissions and also remove excess carbon from the atmosphere because just stopping is already not enough. And agriculture and land use, which is in the area of our interest today, is responsible, as, as Elka said, um, between 25, 24, 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So finding a way to reduce the emissions in this sector is key. And here is the picture I especially like. And this is the NASA satellite image of carbon dioxide emissions during the start of the agriculture season in the Northern Hemisphere in around April. The winds blow vertically, so of course we can see it also over the ocean. But why is that happening? Because during this time, all the mass farming machineries go to the field and start tilling and moving the ground. And this, of course, releases the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and physically it also kills life in the soil by, by moving, moving the ground and all the system that has been uh, were created underground. So first of all, to stop carbon dioxide emissions in agriculture, we have to stop tilling and moving the soil. This is key. And this is key because soil holds the keys to change. Um, we say that one of the best kept secrets in the world today is the solution to global warming and the climate crisis lies right under our feet. Because soil is a huge carbon tank it, and it's a living organism, it's alive. And how it works? So carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants from atmosphere and gets underground through the plant. And then it's used by all microorganisms and bacteria, which through metabolism convert it to chemical nutrients and microelements that there are then absorbed by the plant by through roots. And the whole plant is the nutrient dense. And of course, this is only when the soil is healthy and full of microorganisms and, and bacteria, because when it's not, uh, it uh, it doesn't, the, the carbon dioxide doesn't transfer into nutrients and we have to add those nutrients artificially. And this is what is happening in the mass agriculture. We give, put the artificial nutrients to the soil to enable plant growth. But it doesn't mean that the plant is full of nutrients. It's just potassium and, and the nutrient which we add. And so what we get from the mass uh, agriculture is the plants and, and food that has very little nutritional value. And the solution to that is what we call now regenerative farming. Uh, it's a set of principles and practices that involve, first of all, no tilling and moving the ground. But of course, there are some other principle, uh, principles like the cover crops, integrating animals uh, to, the, to the farms uh, via free animal grazing. And there are some other uh, practices like agroforestry and bi biodynamics and permaculture farming, uh, increasing biodiversity. So there are like many, many elements of uh, regenerative farming, but the base is not to not to till the ground. And there, is, there are even special machineries now in the uh, worldwide that you don't move the ground, but you but you plant seeds and, and, and little plants directly in the soils through the punctures <laughs> in the ground. So, and what is great is that food that comes from regenerative farms, it's called nature positive food. Mm -hmm. Let me quickly move there to the next slide. Um, and of course, regenerative agriculture is not new. It has been practiced around the world for many generations by indigenous communities. And now we are just bringing them back to life and we call it regenerative, but uh, it's just called different. And um, although they have some common base principles, as I mentioned, they have also many differences around the world and depending on the region and, and weather and cultural backgrounds. 
Um, so there are no two identical regenerative farms in the world. And it's very beneficiary. It's not only doing no harm agriculture to the land, but actually improving the land and using technologies. Uh, we, we are using now technologies that regenerate and revitalize the soil and the whole environment. First of all, because the soil sequesters the large amounts of carbon dioxide and produce nutrient dense food. This is the key takeaway. And um, if you look at the big sectors, depending on agriculture, that, for example, food and beverage production, food and beverage service, uh, textiles and apparel, like linen and table clothing, and also natural cosmetics and all the fragrance essences and oils, they are all encompassed by hospitality and tourism. Let me move the, the slides. And this is where our story begins because we both, me and Anna, come from the hospitality and food background. And it was obvious for us that tourism, being so much dependent on food and agriculture, products must help and support regenerative agriculture as they can shape demand and have the ability to influence what kind of food should be grown and how should be grown. But still, at the national and global levels, the farming and tourism sectors operate in a relative isolation from one another. And so there, here is a great potential for the two sectors to unite and start cooperating. And this is what Host for Life is about. And of course, not only me and Anna saw the huge potential of agriculture and food systems in a fighting climate crisis, because according to a European Institute of Innovation, EIT, regenerative agriculture is now the second most important food trend this year. And also big global brands saw this potential and started investing in the regenerative agriculture. And of course, those are the big brands from food sector like Danone and Nestle, but even, uh, even alcohol brands and luxury brands like Moe Hennessy and wineries uh, started investing there. Also fashion and outdoor clothing like Patagonia, you know it well, and, but also Dior, uh, cosmetics, banks, and even tech companies like Microsoft and Sony using, uh, they are setting up projects and using technology and artificial intelligence to help farmers sequester carbon in the grounds and, and uh, uh, regenerative practices. So, me as a marketing person, I studied marketing and worked over 20 years in marketing as a head of brands and, and, and similar roles. So I understand this absolutely huge power of marketing concepts based on nature positive products. And of course, there will be a lot of greenwashing, but if you use it wisely, it will work. And on this slide, you see the true and existing claims, marketing claims from brands that already operate in this regenerative area. Like, of course, nature positive food, but these oats help save the planet. Or the bedding you use is uh, for a climate positive sleep. And you can use this in a numerous ways, and only if you uh, apply regenerative practices and solve uh, nature positive products, you can start using these claims. And it will be really powerful and differentiate, differentiating for your businesses. And I wanted to show you the example, how it looks in real life. And on the left-hand side, uh, you see the wineries that are already regenerative farming practices. You see the flowers and how beautiful it is that some other plants and animals grazing. And, and on the right-hand side, you see the picture that you know well from the typical uh, uh, winery that you that you see that it's really clean and wiped out of every other plant than besides the the wine grapes, and um, even if at the beginning it would be difficult for you and your businesses uh, to source food from regenerative farming, you can start with offering nature positive wines in your venues, for example. And this is um. One of the most important slides today, and it shows in one 
place the clear positive benefits of all the sectors working together. Because creating partnerships between farmers and hospitality um, on a macro and macro scale and micro scale is a benefit for everyone, all the stakeholders. For example, hosts, of course, source local healthy food and shorter their food chain, and they have smaller carbon footprint and offer better experience for the visitors. But also local communities benefit a lot as in it increases their food safety. You know that the, the food that comes from regenerative farms, they have the huge and really large roots comparing to the small and weak roots from the mass farming. And when you have a hurricane or a flood that normally in mass farming, the washes away all the crop or, or, uh, or the wind uh, sweeps away all the crop. And when you have the, hu the, the huge, large system of roots, they will they are stable and they are resilient to those extreme weather conditions. And also it's so more resilient to the, uh, to the um, illnesses of in, in plant illnesses and you don't have to put herbicides and pesticides because the plants work together and they kind of help each other and protect each other against the um, uh, diseases and, and other and insects, for example. It's a huge benefit for the visitors because they they you, you offer them educational experience and unique ingredients in the in their gastronomy uh, gastronomic experiences and of course some regenerative healing uh, experience connecting to nature and so that they can also engage with local residents and um, of course they will eat a more nutrient dense food. Farmers will benefit because they will have a more diversified income and secured income, and they will have a growth in the demand for their products and sell more then. Um, and of course, this is when you it, it will be uh, enabled um, for them to cooperate with hotels and restaurants. And the huge beneficiary is the nature and ecosystems themselves because we sequester the carbon dioxide. We will use less fertilizer. There will be less uh, crop loss because of the weather conditions. And the biodiversity is growing because the, what is important in the, in the regenerative farming that you grow uh, local plants and local varieties in bigger quantities than the normal. There is also one more uh, topic that we would like to um, uh, direct your thinking to, um, is the concept of wellness. Uh, the Global Wellness Institute defines it as the pursuit for activities and lifestyles for holistic health, but it is an individual pursuit. And it's a self-help, it's a self-care, and it's about me, my body, and my mind. And if hospitality adopted regenerative and nature positive concept as even going beyond wellness. So uh, it, it's such a, such a huge benefit because it's also regenerating our minds and bodies, but at the same time, nature. So this concept is really going beyond, um, beyond wellness and it's even more powerful. So you can ask yourself what you can do now of course, you can start with small steps, but first of all, you can partner with regenerative farms from your area or, or, or your country. If there is no farm in the vicinity or in, in, in nearby, you can create your own regenerative farm. Many hotels and restaurants have their own gardens and you can apply regenerative principles there. You can source nature positive foods and other products like textiles and I don't know wine that I mentioned from other countries. You can bring your visitors to regenerative farms and give them this experience to being close to nature and educate them. You can help local farmers switch to regenerative farming because you have farmers that you cooperate with and you enhance them and give them support and they will become your partner in this um, in this model. You can also join a lot of existing regenerative projects worldwide. It's, it, there are many. Or you can start step by step by simply enhancing farmers to plant local heritage varieties. You can partner with seed savers and, and really bring back those heritage plants and heritage food to 
this, this way preserving the culture. And now I would like to, because this was more of the theory, and I would like to uh, show you a couple of um, success stories. Uh, how you can make hospitality and regenerative tourism work together. And I'm aware that there are already thousands of great examples worldwide, but we have time to present only a few of them today. I tried to select my favorite ones, and I, I also wanted to, uh, them to be different from each other, so to address different perspectives. And I'm sure that um, they are very powerful and they will inspire you to, um, to further action. First, is uh, the project that's called Malama Hawaii. That's uh, one of the recent uh, activities uh, introduced by Hawaii Tourism Board after the pandemic or during the late stage of, uh, of, of pandemic. Malama translates to taking care, but also a light. And they created an experience where you visit a local regenerative Kalo farm, learn about regeneration and local food species and help by working in a farm, uh, experience the nature, enjoy it. And at the end, you are able to sample a little bit of work you put in this day as you cook with the chef and then have lunch. On this farm, they built a nursery where they grow over 160 different species of native Hawaiian plants. And out of which 65 species is the main ingredient of the Hawaiian cuisine, this is Kalo. And they say it's not just about to plant and harvest, it's to create the whole ecosystem. And it's about the feeding the animals and plants in order to feed yourself. And this, uh, this idea is especially like. So, and the preservation of species is preserving the culture. And I tell you, I've been to Hawaii exactly 10 years ago, working on my article about local hotels and concepts. And as hotels were great, and some restaurants as well, it was so extremely difficult to find a local cuisine with local ingredients anywhere on the island. Besides um, touristy pineapple farm visits, for example. And I interviewed a chef working for Fairmont Hotel then. He came from indigenous community and he was one of the first in Hawaii 10 years ago to explore local heritage food. And he even created a, a cookbook and published it through the um, hotel, but it was one of the first publications. So it was really not so long ago, just 10 years. And what is now present and obvious 10 years ago was non-existing in, in Hawaii and only pioneers talked about the heritage food. Now they understand that visiting a place and taking care of this place and making this place better than it was before you got there, this is the essence of the regenerative tourism. And I love this example. Another example is the Zero Footprint Project. It's a project called, uh, created by Anthony Mind, and it's an initiative to mobile, mobilize food businesses and consumers together to support regenerative agriculture. It gives everyone the power to fight climate change and eat better food at the same time and how it works. Uh, cooperating restaurants in this, in this project commit 1% of their revenue to fund regenerative farming project, projects. They call it a 1% pledge. Restaurants um, simply deduct this 1% uh, from their revenue and pay directly to, uh, to the project, or they can add this 1% to the consumer bill. This is what is often, often happening. And then, as a zero footprint project distributes this grant to cooperating farmers. Additional amount, 1% is really minimal and I would say even symbolic to customers, it's like 10 cents, yeah? So customers don't even feel it, but altogether it makes a significant impact. And the idea is that one of us can solve the climate crisis independently, but we will all make a, a small contribution that add up to, to, to the dramatic change and collective action. And uh, Mint was um, named Humanitarian of the Year by the, by the famous uh, James Byrd Foundation. And it's now present all over the world, really not only in the US, but also in Hong Kong, in Germany, in Nordic countries, Liechtenstein, Austria, Switzerland joining this year. So it's really around uh, the world, but if it's not present in your country, you can bring this idea 
to other sectors, so depending on agriculture. And hotels can, can, can pledge this um, uh, some amount of money and food producers and food retailers and fashion retailers. So it's so simple. And I, I also love this idea. Another Anna, sorry to interrupt you. We only have one minute left. <laughs> I, I talk only about one more example. We, we are running uh, out of time, but I, I love it. This is a beer wine farm in South Africa. And this is a very winery, very well known. And um, I can confirm that the wine, uh, the wine is great. I, I've been there as well. Uh, but what they are doing besides wine production is impressive. Uh, one of the owners, uh, a guy called uh, Angus McIntosh, he was born in South Africa. He went to study finance in London. He was a stockbroker working in finance in a suit. He met his future wife in London. She was the daughter of this of the wine farm owner and they moved back to, to the winery and he loved it and he decided to be a farmer he just left this financial life and he set up a farm to, next to a winery and then he introduced the biodynamic farming principles and at this time it was 2004 it was not even called regenerative there was nothing like the regenerative farming so he was one of the pioneers and he was also the first farmer in the world to sell carbon credits for increasing the carbon content in the soil in the pastures now you have credit carbon banks all over the world and and companies buying offset from from, from farmers uh, to, to reduce their uh, carbon footprint. But, and this was so many years ago. But during the pandemic, uh, they employ, they did even more. They employed a food garden manager to also introduce farming practices in the gardens. And they taught local communities how to grow food this way. And they were giving away seed boxes, boxes with seed with instructions how to grow food and such uh, uh, and, and apply regenerative principles. So all of a the sudden they saw these community gardens popping out everywhere in South, uh, nearby in South Africa and people learned how to grow their own food and they have not only food for themselves, but they produce the surpluses that they could sell even uh, outside the, the winery and in, even in Cape Town. So it was so much beneficial and the sense of, of connectivity and belonging in the community was huge. So there are so many examples I would like to talk about, but we are uh, out of time today and I would gladly meet with you in the future over the same topic. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and you're right, the examples are really inspiring. So you see that it can work because often when you tell a marketing story, you get the question, yes, but does it really work in practice? And so that's why, why I would like to pass on the word to Caroline because she owns a, a plant-based restaurant and she can tell us um, if it works and, and how, how she managed to make it work. Uh, Caroline, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elke. Thank you, everybody, um, for the invitation. It's an honor to, to present the restaurant and as a case study of sustainable best practices, um, as we offer already for since basically 2008, uh, together with my husband. Um, I try to move, yes, with the slide. Um, so we basically coined the term botanical gastronomy in 2008. Uh, that's the time that my husband and I started collaborating on, on this concept um, as a way to explain uh, in just a few words what we are doing. Uh, it is a fine dining concept that we offer. Um, um, but just a single tasting menu, which is 100% inspired by the botanical garden of, uh, of a farm. Therefore, you, we use the term botanical gastronomy. And all this in combination with a lot of research on uh, how can we implement sustainability in hospitality business, which has to be as be profitable. Um, we have um, a staff of 14 people at this moment, so lots of salaries that has to be paid. Um, uh, but as we opened the restaurant in 2016, let's say the restaurant in its original concept with uh, nine tables and about 30 seats, um, 
we uh, we are still existing even after uh, the pandemic pandemic and the energy crisis of this moment. Um, so we received in the past years quite a lot of accolades. Um, so 2018, we were voted the best vegetable chef by Gumio, which is quite a renowned culinary guide. And that also helped us um, besides the other awards, such as best vegan restaurant of the world, and then 2020 best, well, 2020 Green Michelin star. All these accolades, they, they help us to, to actually give credibility to what we are doing. Um, because to be honest, in the beginning when we opened the restaurant, um, it was quite challenging, especially because um, sustainability or plant-based uh, cuisine is more accepted in the more bistro style, um, lower priced also, uh, while we are actually doing the opposite, um, but at the same time not offering caviar or lobster or other kinds of what they call luxury, luxury products. So uh, the first years were a bit challenging, um, but as we've been investing a lot in um, in storytelling also, and and thank you so much, Anna, for for speaking about the authentic storytelling, which is uh, it's very important if you speak about what the values that you want to show the world that they are authentic and straight from the heart, and I think that resonated with uh, with a lot of people, and uh, since. Let's say since 2017, uh, you've been always full booked. And uh, so I think it's, uh, it's a success story. So just a brief overview of uh, what we are doing. I start first with the general uh, best practices. Um, well, waste reduction, of course, is an important one. And waste reduction for us is not just food waste. I will speak. Uh, briefly a bit later about it, but waste reduction also in terms of, for example, the cork of the wine bottles we keep separate and they are going to specific company who can reuse these, uh, these, these parts. Um, so there is a part in us which, um, well, there's, there are policies to recycle. Um, there are also policies to upcycle, for example, the white caps on um, let's say the almond milk bottles, uh, these white caps, they also go to a certain company and they make shares of that. So that's, a, that's an example of upcycling. So we figured out different recycling uh, streams and pathways uh, in order to uh, break down basically the waste and to either reuse it, recycle or upcycle uh, all the different parts of, of the, the waste. Um, pathway. Um, for example, also water is no longer bought in bottles, and, and especially not the single use plastic uh, bottles. We have a micro, we invested in a micro filtering system um, where we can uh, have our own glass bottles, which are just reused all the time. And it's really upon request. So people, um, we, we refill the bottles upon request of the guests. And if there's still water left, that will go to uh, the boiler, for the water boiler to make tea and coffee with it. So it's also a way to uh, reduce uh, water waste. Uh, for example, also our reusable incentive program uh, has to do with uh, in hospitality. There is a lot of uh, focus. Well, there's a lot of use of single-use plastics. So we have containers which with a very made of a very strong material, un almost unbreakable, and and we encourage also people or. or um, our staff to, to use these kind of containers. Um, the same, for example, with coffee filters, they are no longer used as we found out um, coffee press system, which is um, like a French press. So coffee filters are, are not necessary anymore. Um, if we look at, for example, what we can do also in, in, in hospitality is um, reducing uh, air pollution and chemical pollution. Air pollution in, in our sense is that we give incentives to our staff and our guests to come by uh, public transport or by bike. Um, and our staff also receive um, 
um, a, a bit of extra salary for, for that. So it's a, a bit of award for, for their uh, investment in, uh, in, the, in buying a bicycle and or coming by public transport. And also chemical uh, reduction uh, means actually that we only use natural uh, cleaning products um, and as a way to, um, to have less impact on, uh, on the water pathways in, in our city. If you now focus on, um, go to the next slide. Okay, um, on the specific food policies that we have, we uh, are 100% um, plant-based restaurant, which means there is no, uh, no animal produce use in the menu. Um, the first year we were a vegetarian restaurant, we were still using um, dairy products and uh, butter. In the, in the menu, um, especially in Belgium, we have this, this culinary heritage um, of using butter, especially in, in wintertime. In summertime, we were basically a vegan restaurant, uh, but in wintertime, we were then still in the first year, uh, we were a vegetarian restaurant. And as also in, uh, in pastry, uh, becoming 100% plant-based, uh, no egg whites, for example, or no uh, cream, uh, it is a challenge. But we, we felt the urge to, to really show also other colleagues, other chefs, that it is possible to, to, to have an, a plant-based fine dining restaurant where everybody can come and have a culinary experience, no matter if they they are vegan them, themselves. Um, and this is something that we've been doing already now for a couple of years. And also, uh, the, well, the proof is on the pudding. So we are always full booked, so it seems. And we have um, a very broad range of, of guests from young to, to, to elders, um, all different kinds of um, backgrounds. So there's a lot of openness, uh, more and more openness, basically, for, for uh, for dining 100% plant-based. Um, and uh, as Anna also referred to, we work uh, with 99% uh, with one farmer. He is uh, working uh, in a regenerative way. It's a bit of combination, permaculture, biodynamic principles, um, but also uh, has a strong emphasis on uh, bird and, and insect-friendly uh, farming so it is quite a wild farm um, where herbs are growing next to uh, vegetables and vegetables are, are alternated by fruit trees so um, it looks chaotic but um, we noticed year after year because we are working already with him for the past um, 10 11 years um, he is um, his uh, produce his vegetables and his his herbs, they are becoming more and more arom aromatic and the, the flavors are just better year after year. And that's definitely a result of regenerative farming. Um, and he is situated, uh, our farmer is uh, located um, less than 100 uh, kilometer radius from the restaurant. And if we work with other producers, we always uh, do research on the distance of uh, the restaurant. Um, he, for us, sustainability is not just what we are offering to our guests, but also sustainable relationships. So we are working already with them for 11 years. And the fact that we uh, have this long term relationship, it helped the farmer also to do financial, take financial risk and do financial investments in his farm. So he knew that he, he has a very good client uh, uh, with us. So he knew, uh, well, the restaurant Humans and Afton's will be there also the coming years. So I can do this, uh, take this risk and do this investment. And so what the menu concerns, we are in daily contact with our farmer. He tells us what is in, in the peak season, so it takes us seven days uh, to create um, a dish. Um, and uh, so he tells us, okay, this, let's say, fennel is now 
a bit speak for the coming three weeks. So we create something around funnel and then we serve it for the coming three weeks to our, to our guests. And we have 10 different dishes. So every week, basically, we are changing one dish in the menu. So this is the, the system that we have implemented to really follow very closely the, the, the micro seasons, not just the four seasons, which is not accurate, but really in detail every week, every two weeks, we, we notice that there, is, there are ingredients which are just at its best flavor. And we also distinguish um, between food loss and food waste. Um, it's on a spectrum. Um, first, you think about where is the food coming from? So, of course, in the field and in the field, uh, there can be food loss um, due to, let's say, overproduction uh, of certain ingredients or there is some difficulties with, with climate and there is uh, um, a food loss happening. Um, our farmer communicates with us about this. And then um, just to give an example, there was an, an overproduction of uh, yeah, too much um, shiso leaves, um, which is very aromatic. Um, and in order to help them and not to lose uh, all these ingredients in the field, we uh, created a Belgian chocolate, which is infused with this, uh, with this aromatic uh, shiso leaves. So we, as we made a tincture of that, we needed a lot of these leaves and we could uh, give him uh, a good, um, good price for the leaves. And at the same time, we had a very original uh, Belgian chocolate. Um, and then if you look at the, the other side of, of the spectrum on food waste, and that is happening in the restaurants, it can happen in the restaurant. And we have different also procedures uh, to reduce food waste. For example, there is a route to leave uh, policy where every part of the, let's say, carrot is used one way or the other. Um, we have also, um, a policy, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, on the beverages, um, uh, the policy there is that, for example, parts of um, a certain vegetable, let's say the peels of um, Jerusalem artichoke, um, which is quite aromatic, and that comes to me because I'm the responsible for beverages, um, and we dry it for 48 hours, make a powder with that, and that powder is again infused in one of my uh, botanical drinks that I then offer in combination with that specific dish, which, for example, Jerusalem artichoke, and that way we create like a full spectrum of use of all the different uh, ingredients. Um, um, we, we, we coined uh, we, the term that we use is from solid to liquid, liquid because there is no difference between what you find on your plate and what you find in the paired, uh, in paired glasses. So the, the botanical drinks, they are inspired by the menu which is offered uh, to a guest. So it are really similar ingredients, similar farmer, well, the same farmer and similar ingredients. Sustainability, um, we on, not only offer uh, alcohol-based or non-alcohol-based homemade uh, artisanal drinks, we also serve uh, natural wines. And then we also have a quite rigorous selection on um, either Demeter, biodynamic, natural, uh, organic, certified. Um, we have, uh, I have a strong interest also in Belgian wines and that's the unfortunate uh, side effect. Um, but in a way, interesting that Belgium became a, a very good wine country um, due to the climate change. Um, but we, we encourage also these kind of uh, local uh, winemakers. And of course, Belgium is a country uh, which is known for its beers. So it is less popular uh, to serve uh, artisanal beers in, in a fine dining restaurant, but still we are, I'm determined to not give up uh, this culinary her heritage. And I think this is something that uh, we have to be in each country. We have uh, in hospitality business, um, we have a platform where we can uh, show the, the wonderful uh, artisanal 
uh, produce or the craft uh, ingredients that uh, that we have in a country. So it's something that that platform basically I use to to put these craftsmen and craftswomen in in the picture. Go to the next slide. Um, just to end uh, with a project that we've started in um, basically in COVID times. Um, it, it already was in my mind since 2015 after reading a, a report of the United Nations where they were mentioned the, the poor condition uh, of, the, of the soil worldwide. And I realized that actually I was like, um, you could say soil illiterate. I didn't know anything about the soil. And then I start uh, um, investing about the importance of the soil for a rich and, and fruitful harvest. Uh, so fertile soil is just essential uh, for a food system. And so I realized that as I didn't know, and I had already quite some eco-consciousness, I was sure that most of my colleague chefs um, or restaurant owners also weren't aware about the importance of the soil, this term farm to table, but they often forget that it's actually more important to say soil to table. Um, so we started a movement which we call Soil Mates, together uh, chefs, uh, restaurant owners, uh, scientists, soil scientists, for example, uh, artists, um, and also, of course, regenerative farmers to give a voice to the soil. The soil has is, has difficulties to speak to us, so, so we we use the voice of an artist or the voice of a scientist, ac academic academic voice of a scientist, for example, to speak uh, to let the earth speak to us. And I would like to show you a brief video of um, an event that we organized together with a group of. Uh, 10 chefs, uh, there were over three days, there were 250, more than 250 guests uh, visiting the regenerative farm of our farmer. And um, also a lot of uh, artists were also present to give a voice to the fertile soil. The sound is not on. Who are we? It is. We are human beings inhabiting this earth and living on top of soil. This soil is not just the surface upon which we tread, it is a living substance that sustains us. The food we eat is nourished by the health of the soil, which then becomes the health of our bodies. In this way, we are the earth. We are farmers, chefs, artists, foodies, and dreamers coming together to create connections between people, food, art, and the soil. Connections that bring awareness, raise questions, and inspire actions. We are here to celebrate the biodiversity and generosity of the earth, and to honor the abundant living soil by creating edible works of art. We are soil mates. Yeah, thank you so much, Caroline, yeah. for that video. It's very, it's, it's very nice to look at. Um, we have, I think, uh, seven minutes left because we started five minutes late. Uh, and I'm sorry, Alessandro, because I promised you the double of time. But um, <laughs> I would still like to encourage those that are in the webinar to stay here for another seven minutes for a few questions. Not so much from the audience, but from our um, from Dr. Galli, who is actually an expert. Please, um, Dr. Gali, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Elke, and thanks, Anna and Caroline, uh, for the presentations. I mean, I will be uh, very brief and provide like a very quick recap because we we don't have like questions so far on the 
on the chat. But basically, uh, what I want to say is that uh, I think we have seen quite importantly what is the role of food in contributing to the pressure that um, human activities place on the on on the planet we have seen through your uh, introduction Elke and then through the the presentation of uh, of Anna so it's really an important part but it's also an important part in the hospitality well in the tourism sector in general usually uh, my experience is that when people in the tourism sector think about sustainability and how to lower their impact the mind immediately goes just to travel how do we uh, go from one place to the other and it is true that like arriving in places is the main driver of our impact when we act as tourism but once a destination uh, there are like several studies that we have conducted in the last two years um, once a destination the way in which um, let's say as stakeholders of the tourism industry we provide food for people is indeed like the major driver of impacts at uh, a destination so it's quite interesting to see uh, all these uh, activities uh, going on and and it's also quite interesting what Caroline was saying uh, that sustainability is not just about sustainability environmental sustainability when you shift your approach and your mindset the way in which you provide food is not just an environmental impact that you are causing but there is a lot of social transformation so uh, it's uh, particularly interesting what she was saying about the relationship with the local farmer uh, and the the way in which through her business she can both ensure that she sorts sustainable products but at the same time she can make sure that this farmer has a sustainable income and a stable income so I think I really would like to stress also the positive role for the social relationship of the type of approach that um, she is bringing but the main question which I think probably most of the people in audience are asking themselves is what is the economic viability of all of this? Because this shift must be first economically viable and second must be culturally acceptable. I mean, you cannot offer something else to tourists if the tourists don't want this something else. So I would actually like to reflect and ask Caroline, what is let's say the financial viability of her uh, of her uh, business and what was uh, her experience first with the acceptance from the customer on the type of food that she is offering and then maybe if you caroline can uh, just tell us a little bit more about the cost of oper of operating this type of alternative fine dining restaurant compared to the conventional one mm. Yes, interesting question. Um, um, what we um, well, we started in in two thousand sixteen, but we started not out of the blue. So we were preparing already for many years uh, this restaurant, and you know, putting yourself in the spotlight helps, of course, that there is some curiosity of what are those two people doing there. So I think having a bit of marketing. Uh, skills is important if you start this kind of adventure. Um, you have to be quite adventurous to, 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 to offer not the mainstream cuisine. Um, but at the same time, I think um, that's, that's, let's say, the psychological part of it. But I think it is, um, if I speak as an entrepreneur, um, the fact that we offer something which is so unique, it, it doesn't exist in Belgium in, on, on this level, um, and that you, at a certain point, you start attracting people from, from everywhere. In the beginning, there were people from Belgium, and after a while, there were people traveling to Brussels to just to visit our restaurant. So you, your, your uni uniqueness, the fact that we offer uh, something which is 100% plant-based in, in the form of a tasting menu um, is something that people can't do at home. We have um, 
there's lots of research behind there's lots of uh, prepping time that we need we have staff of 14 people and people our guests realize that this is uh, so exceptional what what they are eating there uh, that uh, they they start spreading the word basically so it's the, the unique uniqueness of of what we offer that is our selling point Okay, and I think last time uh, when when we were like chatting briefly among us before this meeting, you were you were mentioning that there is probably a reduced cost in your business in terms of raw material, but an increased cost in terms of research and preparation of the various dishes, right? Mm -hmm, indeed. So yes, we we don't work with so-called luxury products uh, so there's no big expense on food costs like uh, caviar or lobster or things like that um, but on the other hand uh, in Belgium at least uh, we have uh, we need many hands to prepare this kind of fine dining experience so we have a staff of uh, 14 people but we don't see it as an expense it's more like investing in human capital um, as we have a lot of young chefs who are really motivated they're coming a bit from everywhere in the world we have like a sous chef from Mexico we had uh, an intern from India uh, now we have uh, a chef recently started from Portugal, so it's it's quite an international team, and we see ourselves more as mentors, as 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 coach of in in how to run a sustainable business. So it's it, you know, you have to you have to have a sound business, of course, but it's not all about that. It's more than that. Yeah, thank you. I I like this way of framing. The, the additional people that you need, uh, again, as a positive, let's say, social aspect of, of what you're doing is not just an additional cost, but is the possibility to really like grow a team and like increase uh, the number of jobs that you are uh, creating and, and also favoring cultural exchange that can hopefully like spray these and, and help it uh, scale up and, and, and be replicated. Uh, Elke, I think we have uh, completed the time. So I will just like give it the floor back to you so you can uh, conclude. Thank you so much for your patience, uh, Alessandro. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, if um, there is a question that will come to your mind a bit later, please do not hesitate to still ask us. Or if you want to look again, it's possible you will get uh, a link to the recording and see um, more in detail about the examples or the things that we have been sharing. Uh, please feel free to contact any one of us. And I wish you um, um, a lot of luck um, with sustainable food in the near future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.